Um, and it is the last you know, this group of talks of the day. Uh, and uh, to stay fresh, you know, maybe we have a little bit of an opportunity that we don't usually have at these conferences. Maybe you could, you know, take a walk to keep your brain going and watch on your phone or sit on your favorite couch. I guess what I'm saying is that you could go for a change of environment. And speaking of an acoustic environment, uh, we're going to have the auditory scene analysis talks. And to kick that off with a talk titled Auditory Spatial Hearing, a Multi-System Process, is a true giant in the field of uh, auditory scene analysis. Um, and also a person who graciously served on my comprehensive exams committee, uh, William Yost. Take it away whenever you're ready. Thank you, Jake. Thanks everybody uh, for showing up. I'm afraid my abstract was a little over ambitious. You would think I would learn by now. Uh, but I do want to point out that uh, spatial hearing um, is quite multifaceted. It allows listeners to locate objects in the environment, no matter where the object might be, relative to listeners, day and night, uh, no matter what the light situation. It makes it possible to navigate successfully in complex acoustic environments of many sound sources and their possible deflections allows for successful communication in acoustically cluttered, noisy environments. And it aids visually locating objects uh, when the objects have also have to generate sounds. As the auditory system has no spatial receptors and sound has no attributes of extension like size, shape, distance, et cetera, the advantages, these advantages that I outlined above of spatial hearing really rest on many neural calculations of information provided by the auditory periphery. You need a brain to localize sound sources. Uh, these calculations are performed by many neural systems. Thus, spatial hearing is a multi-system process, not just an auditory process. And I'll, I'll talk more a little bit about that during the talk. So this paper focuses on a particular challenge that spatial hearing has, and that's the challenge that exists due to so-called cones of confusions. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the ways in which uh, cones of confusion errors can be overcome. So this is our lab. Um, and this is my colleague, Dr. Uh, Pastore, taking his favorite ride every day. Uh, so this is a sound bed room with a pretty low Reverb time, 36 loudspeakers on a five foot radius sphere, a rotating chair, and also a uh, six camera uh, motion detection system uh, in the room. So excuse me if this is redundant, but it's, I felt it was very important that we all be on the same page of what the auditory spatial cues are. Uh, if there's a source off the one side of a listener, the sound will arrive at the near ear before it arrives at the far ear. And that interval time difference is a cue. As the source, for instance, moves toward the right ear, that interval time difference grows. All that although that arrival time difference is just, uh, just a few microseconds, uh, tens of microseconds, uh, the brain can still make the computation and use it to help localize the sound source, but only for low frequencies. That same sound, uh, will also arrive at the closer ear uh, with a higher level than at the far ear, due almost entirely to the fact that the sound will reflect off the head and diffuse around the head, producing a sound shadow on the opposite side of the head uh, that encompasses the ear opposite the sound source, which produces a much lower level at this ear. So there's an interall level difference. That interall level difference grows uh, as, again, the sound source moves uh, from in front to one side. The sound shadow, and hence the interall level difference, is frequency dependent. If the wavelength of the sound, which is inversely proportional to frequency, decreases, then there'll be greater reflection and less, uh, uh, and, uh, less diffraction, leading to an even greater sound shadow. At low frequencies, there's a lot of diffraction and not much uh, reflection, uh, and the sound shadow is less. There's also spectral cues, spectral uh, differences that exist because of the, inter the interaction of reflections and diffraction with frequency. 
Uh, so here's a case where the sound source is below the observer, uh, at ear height on the observer and above. And this is the spectral change, the change in the spectrum when the sound is below, at, or above ear level. And these ripples only start to occur at frequencies in the neighborhood of four kilohertz and above. Below four kilohertz, as I said, not much happens uh, because most of the sound is diffracted around, not reflected from uh, the listener. These ripples, here's an example of a feature in the ripple that moves upward as the sound moves upward and therefore might be a cue for the vertical position of the sound source. These ripples are due all largely, not entirely, but largely to the various uh, grooves, helixes, anti-helixes uh, within the penna. So the penna sizes of these grooves are about equal to the wavelength of these higher frequencies. So at these high frequencies, the penna alters the spectrum, provides spectral features uh, that may be used for cues for localization. Since each of us have a unique, almost a unique penna, almost like a fingerprint, uh, the spectral ripples for each of us are different. They're individualized, okay? And we'll come back and talk about that slightly. However, a challenge, if we're going to use binaural cues, either the interall time difference or the interall level difference, is the so-called cone of confusion. Uh, discovered or, or, or not necessarily discovered, but computed back in the late 1930s uh, in the same year, one by Hans Wallach and another by Woodworth. Uh, Woodworth actually named it cones of confusion. Wallach didn't give it a name. Uh, so there's a, there's a surface uh, on a cone and any sound source on that surface will produce the same interall time difference uh, and usually are often the same interall level difference. So for instance, here's a sound on the horizontal plane, on the azimuth plane in front of the listener here and in back of the listener here. These two sound sources produce exactly the same paths to the two ears and therefore the same interall time and most likely the same interall uh, uh, level difference. And that can lead to front back reversals. That can lead to the situation in which listeners cannot tell the difference between sounds that are from, coming from the front and those that are coming from the back. So how do we overcome those? We didn't overcome them, the sound source localization using uh, binaural cues wouldn't be of much use, okay? So in order to do that, I want to sort of lay out the geometry a little bit so we're, so we're clear about that. So here's a subject in our 24 azimuthal loudspeaker array. The subject happens to be facing at this instant in time loudspeaker two, and the sound is coming from loudspeaker four. So we'll reference everything to loudspeaker one. It's a circle, it doesn't make much difference where we re uh, reference to, but we do need a reference, a world's reference. And here there's an angle that the head is moved, the head is moved, and it's we're gonna reference where it's moved to the circle, to the world, to, to the environment uh, that the listener is in. The sound uh, also has an angle in world-centric coordinates in the world, okay? Uh, and then there's a third angle, the obvious one, between the head and the sound. So this is sound and head-centric coordinates. This is the sound relative to where the head is, this is the sound relative to where it is in the world. This is the head angle relative to where the head is in the world. So the head world-centric location, this yellow angle, could be determined by cues from the visual system, the proprioceptive system, and our vestibular system. And those are the ones that have been primarily studied. Other systems may uh, contribute, but they haven't been studied yet. The head-centric angle of the sound, this angle, is provided by the auditory spatial cues. The auditory spatial cues tell the nervous system, tell the brain where the sound is relative to the head, not where the sound is in the world. That angle, there is no cue that the brain has that directly indicates where the sound is in the world, i.e. there is no angle available to to the brain that tells me that the sound's coming from loudspeaker four. I could combine the, these two angles, the head-centric angle and the, uh, uh, the head-centric angle of the sound and the head angle 
to get an estimate of the world centric angle where the sound is coming from. Okay. And that kind of makes the point that you need to know where the head is, you need to know where this, what the spatial fuse is, and that requires multiple systems in order to gain those two pieces of information. As I said a minute ago, that if the cues that you were using are the interval time and level differences, then you have cones of confusion. Then you have an angle, a head-centric angle, uh, and it's complementary world-centric angle that puts a, the sound perhaps at loudspeaker 12. So if the listener's facing loudspeaker two, the sound comes from loudspeaker four, the loudspeaker 12 would produce a sound that pro provides the same interval time and level differences as four. So it's highly likely that four and 12 would be confused. So sound source or local editing sound sources is a multi-system, not just an auditory process. So let's get some ideas of how you wind up being able to resolve these cone of confusion, these front back reversals. Uh, so you don't confuse 12 and four, uh, which could be quite literally deadly in some situations. Okay. So what we're gonna do is look at an experiment in which the listeners were presented sounds from six of the 24 loudspeakers. The distance between the loudspeakers was 60 degrees a pretty easy discrimination task. And we want it to be easy because we want to measure front back reversals, not accuracy. So there's three front to back reversals, one to four, two to three, six to five, and then three back to fronts, four to one, three to two, five to six. And here are some data for five different stimuli. Okay, So we have a low frequency wideband stimuli, stimulus centered at 250 hertz, two octave wides, a narrow band low frequency stimulus, a tenth of an octave, very narrow band, centered at 250 hertz. So the equivalent in the high frequency region, two octaves at 4,000 hertz and a tenth of an octave at 4,000 hertz. And then a broadband condition that covers the entire frequency range of these, that is from 250 hertz, excuse me, 8,000 hertz. And what we've plotted here is the front to back number of confusions for each of 29 subjects and the back to front in the sort of orange, okay? And there are a number of things to point out. First, there are a lot of front back reversals. The maximum amount you can have is 60. Uh, so some subjects are giving you the maximum number of reversals. Every single sound uh, that's in the back is reversed to the front. Uh, and this for these couple subjects or almost every one, okay? But the extent to which you get front back reversals, the extent to which stimuli are prone to fact front back reversals, is only the low frequencies and very narrow band high frequencies. Well, if you remember my plot of the spectral differences uh, that I showed you in a previous slide, I pointed out that there are no spectral differences that are really available uh, below 4,000 Hertz. Uh, so it's not su surprising uh, that you don't that you uh, don't have any spectral ripples that you could use. Okay, and if the bandwidth is very narrow, it would be hard to find a spectral feature over such a narrow bandwidth. So when you don't have spectral features that could allow you to disambiguate front back reversals, you get a lot of front back, back, front back reversals. If you do have the ability to extract information from the spectral features due to the penna primarily, then you don't get many front back reversals. Here, uh, with a very wide band 4,000 Hertz, there aren't very many reversals. Some subjects have none. And same for the broadband sound, even fewer reversals. It's not uncommon when one measures front back reversals to say that in a sense, that's not really an error you have the right information about the interall differences. You just make this one type of confusion front to back. So if, which is common in the literature, we counted all of the reversals as correct, as well as the normal correct responses that subjects might make, that's the percent of correct responses across these 29 average over these 29 observers for each of these four stimuli. And you can see that they're very correct, assuming that this, that this conversion of front back reversals to correct is, takes place, okay, which is what we expected. We didn't expect very many errors with this very wide 
uh, spacing. So the punchline is, the take home message is that if the stimulus contains high frequency broadband information, highly unlikely that front back reversals or cone of confusion errors uh, will affect your ability to localize the sound source. But are you stuck? If you have low frequency sounds or narrow band high frequency sounds, are you sort of doomed to make these front back reversals, which can be severe? No, you can move your head and I'm gonna to try to show you why that works. So here's the previous geometry that I showed you a minute ago. And now I'm simply going to change the geometry very slightly. I'm gonna move the head from position two or loudspeaker two where it was facing it previously, and now the listener moves his or her head, the loudspeaker three, the sound still comes from four. Uh, notice that the head-centric angle decreases, uh, the reverse head-centric angle increases, that's shown below here. And so basically what happens in this case is two things, two possible cues, one is, the head-centric angle of the actual source goes in the opposite direction that your head moves when your head moves. So if your head moves some amount, the spatial cues will move in the opposite direction by the same amount. The reverse sound source will move in the same direction your head moves. So if either through experience or through some process, a rule is that if the head and the moves in the same direction as the perceived sound source, then that perceived sound source is not the actual sound source. You want the sound source that moves in the opposite direction, head-related sound source that moves in the opposite direction. That will tell you what is the correct uh, actual sound source resolving a front back reversal. One, and Hans Wallach proposed this particular uh, one as the one you use, uh, you could actually use the uh, uh, world centric. You could use where the sound is actually coming from. You have to compute that somehow. You have to combine the, he the head uh, angle and the uh, spatial cue angle. Uh, but if you did that, you notice that there's no change, obviously, in the actual sound source there is a change in the reverse sound source. It moves twice whatever the distance the head moves. So if the if this actual sound source in the room, if the sound source that you're trying to determine uh, if it's the actual or the reverse one doesn't move, that's the one you want to go with. So front back reversals can be resolved either by the spectrum of the sound or by head rotation. So I'm going to show you in a minute some data that collaborate the use of head rotation. Actually, unfortunately, that's uh All right, I'm over, sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'll just do this real quickly. So here's uh, normal hearing subjects. They have almost no reversals. This is uh, a confusion matrix, correct, reversals, couple reversals, none. This is cochlear implant subjects, huge number of uh, reversals, as soon as they turn their head, they all, all go away. So if you turn your head, you get rid of reversals, and this should be a great advantage to people with cochlear implants who normally do not do well, but if you allow them to move their head and train them to move their head, uh, they do much, much, much better. Sorry for taking for so long. It was, it was great. Don't apologize at all. Um, but I've got a couple questions I'd like to ask. I bet a few others do as well. Um, we'll have to do it in the chat or over email um, because next we're going to move on to Michael Schutz, who is going to give us a talk titled Generalizing Auditory Perception Research, The Importance of Considering Sound Complexity. And Michael, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and share.
Michael, is it possible you're muted? Hello. Okay. There you go. There we go again. Okay. So um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at my first illuminating question here, which is actually a real question. It's not just someone who Zoom bombed and wandered in from some other convention. Uh, I want to talk about whether sound actually plays an important role in auditory perception. It might seem ridiculous, but I'm going to go through a bunch of experimental data that's going to suggest this is actually a question that we need to spend some time pondering over. So this all started a long time ago when I was interested, not necessarily in auditory perception per se, but just music perception issues. And I began researching what I call the marimba illusion, exploring this question of whether it's possible to produce long and short notes on the marimba by using long and short gestures. I'll give you an example of an internationally acclaimed marimbas giving his best examples of long and short now. The synchrony was much better in the actual experimental stimuli, because uh, what I did is I took these recordings of the long and short and broke them apart into the auditory and visual components. And then to try and see how much the gesture and the sound are contributing to our perception of note duration, I then crossed them so that sometimes the audio from the short gesture was paired with the long visual as opposed to the short. These four base conditions made up the audiovisual um, component of the experiment. And my colleagues and I also included an audio alone condition where we just had the auditory information by itself. Now, participants made an evaluation after hearing these in sequence, so just one by one, not in a pair the way we just did. And after seeing each sight and sound combination or hearing the sound alone, they made a rating of this on a scale from long to short. Now, I told participants the sight and sound didn't always go together and asked them to base the ratings on what they were hearing alone because we know the long gesture sounds long, uh, looks long. What we really want to know is if it makes the note sound longer. The position of that slider where they moved it um, at the end of the trial corresponds to a number, and it's the number that appears on the y-axis giving their duration ratings here. So to start off with the audio alone condition, participants didn't distinguish, the ratings didn't distinguish between the notes produced by long and short gestures, but when those same sounds were paired uh, with either long or short visual information, we found that the same note sounds longer when it's paired with the long gesture as opposed to the short gesture. And when it comes to the short audio, we found the same thing because, well, actually, they didn't differ uh, in terms of their, um, the sound to start with. So what we can see now is we have a situation where uh, the visual information is actually allowing the musician to overcome a problem. And while the gestures don't change the sound of the note, they're successful in changing the way the note sounds. Now, musical implications aside, this is an important issue, I think, just in the context of audiovisual integration, because from a scientific perspective, it on one hand both fits with and also conflicts strongly with the previous literature. I'm sure many people here are familiar with the ventriloquist effect, where um, having sight and sound come from different locations results in the visual information dominating our perception. And that, in a sense, is similar to the marimba illusion with a strong visual dominance. But really, it's more akin to a classic timing task, where I were to play a sound and a light at the same time and ask you for the duration of the event, your perception here is going to be strongly governed by the sound because the auditory system has better temporal resolution. Consequently, in study after study, it dominates temporal tasks like assessing duration perception. So to try and understand this, we can think about this almost as a continuum. And in the psychophysics literature, we have one side of this in the sound booth experiments with tightly controlled stimuli that's telling us that duration perception-wise, vision has minimal influence in this context. Whereas from the perspective of the marimba illusion, we had a strong visual influence. We can think about this as a continuum of naturalness or maybe even sound complexity because we have a very different sound produced by the marimba over here in relation to the tone beat. And it's this sound component that I think plays a really crucial role. So just to zip through several years of my research <laughs> career, I think the crucial experiment involves simplifying this to take just a sine wave and shape it either with this flat envelope over here or a decaying percussive envelope over there. So for this experiment, I used the same methods and approaches that I described previously, and now participants were rating their perception of the duration of the sound, and they were again told to ignore the visual information. Here, the visuals were a reduced version built on the original gestures. And so I'm going to show you now examples of the long gesture paired with the flat and percussive tones. Beep. 
When asked to ignore the visual information, we found a replication of the original finding, which is that participants can't ignore the visual information when listening to this percussive sound. However, in contrast, when these are paired with the flat tone, we find no significant difference in the sounds. This is important because it helps to explain and finally resolve this conflict I've been sitting with for years trying to understand why the marimba illusion failed to fit in with all this previous research on the nature of audiovisual integration when it comes to duration perception. But my initial relief at finally getting to the bottom of this was quickly met by more curiosity as to what's going on because I think part of the reason about the difference here between the sounds is if we look at the offset of a percussive tone, it has a very long offset period relative to the sound's duration in contrast to the very abrupt offsets that we see in the flat tone. So this sets up an interesting situation where I suspect we have a literature built on sounds lacking much offset information, whereas we know the offset is very important from other studies done by colleagues showing that it tells us information about the kinds of materials involved in an event and how um, impactfully they were struck together. So if we've done a lot of experiments with certain sounds that fail to exhibit properties that are important for what the perceptual system is latching onto, that sort of brought me back to another level of angst and wondering, well, what about all these things that I thought I understood about the auditory system actually apply outside the sound booth with constrained stimuli? So, Because it seemed to me at the time like we're using a disproportionate amount of these flat tones. But even as I had that thought, I would immediately think of some contrary examples, like John Newhoff's interesting work with the looming and receding tones, or some of Dick Pastore's work looking at the footsteps of walkers, and so on and so forth. So to try to get at a baseline of the kinds of sounds used in auditory research, my team and I went through every experiment published by the journal Music Perception from its inception up to about 2012. And we sorted things into what we thought were going to be four basic categories with the idea of looking primarily at the relationship between the percussive and the flat tones. We quickly realized we actually had to make a fifth category. And the fifth category we called undefined because we used this for situations where there was no information whatsoever about the temporal structure or the amplitude envelope of the tone. And although I initially thought that was going to be a minor category, when we crunched the numbers, that was the largest category of the survey that we found, with 33% of the stimuli used in this premier journal on music perception not giving any information about the temporal structure of the sounds used. Now, I was talking about this with an auditory colleague once when he responded, trying to be helpful, that maybe this lack of definition, which sort of got in the way of my percussive flat comparison, maybe it's because this was only a music journal. And if we used a journal with more rigor, then maybe we'd get better definitions of the sounds. Well, as a sort of proverbial lifelong member of the Music Psychology Society, and now literally as the secretary of the Society for Music Perception and Cognition, I sort of took those to be fighting words. And I decided this is actually an interesting question. I didn't appreciate the time, exactly how long this was going to take, uh, but my students and I over the past several years went through a thousand experiments in four of the top journals publishing auditory research to try to see and put that 33% of undefined sounds for music perception in context. And when we did this, we found that we actually have even a greater level of undefined sounds when we look at um, the, this field of auditory perception as a whole. Now, in a sense that undefinition or that lack of definition is maybe an interesting gotcha moment of journalism, but I don't think it's really the most important aspect of what we're looking at. Because I doubt any of my colleagues, many of whom are on this call here, are trying to deceive uh, reviewers and readers by using interesting temporally varying tones and just failing to disclose that. So the fact that we're more likely to statistically get the exact model of headphone used rather than any information about the amplitude envelope I think it points more to just our expectation that the flat tone is the normative sound in auditory research. In the same way that I don't specify I drive a car with four wheels, I might just say I drive a car. Um, four wheels is the assumption unless you specify differently. So I want to turn our attention now away from the lack of definition uh, to what I think is a more interesting and meaningful issue. And that is the fact that over three quarters of the sounds used in this broad rep representative sample of auditory research are actually flat therefore lacking any kind of meaningful offset information that we know is important in explaining how the, the auditory system works. This causes particular problems with empirical situations like the marimba illusion, where the outcome of that study broke with the previous accepted wisdom in the literature because the sounds used there were disproportionately flat. But if we can turn our attention to the remaining quarter of sounds, there's actually an even more intriguing point that I think we can glean from this. Because ultimately, we can think of sounds in the world as really being only one of two kinds. They either come from an event or they don't. So in our terms here, we either think about them as referential, originating from an event in the world, or being non-referential. 
And when we look at it this way, I think in some ways the most important outcome of this survey is that 90% of the sounds that we use to get our basic understanding of the auditory system have no connection with events in the world. Now, the auditory system evolved in response to many sounds in the world, all of which obviously had some connection and therefore meaning for our system. And what's intriguing uh, is when we look at this remaining 10%, and we went back with a very rigorous analysis here and found almost, almost without exception, these were all done in situations where you could not do the experiment without a referential sound. So if you're looking at the footsteps of walkers to try and understand their posture, you obviously can't do that with a tone beep, and the same thing for identifying instrument timbres. So it seems like the normative way we're going about trying to understand the auditory system is fixating heavily on these non-referential sounds. I'm not saying the sounds are bad per se, but I'm saying this leads to a problem where we have this disproportionate understanding of what the auditory system does. Now, one of the reviewers in sending off one of these papers uh, responded by pushing back and saying, well, who really cares about all this uh, analysis of the stimuli? Because Ultimately, I think what auditory researchers are interested in is the basic structure and function of the auditory system, irrespective of whether or not it generalizes. Well, I disagree with that, and I think it does matter the degree to which our theories and our models generalize uh, to the world outside the lab, but it's an important point that I think is worth considering. And so if we take a page from our colleagues here in visual perception, you might imagine someone who's trying to understand how objects are represented in the brain might struggle with the complexity of real world stimuli and use a bunch of pictures as a stand in. But the problem here, if you want to understand the basic way in which we're representing structure and function in the brain, even if you understand everything about the way objects, uh, about the way lines and colors are separated and angles work, you're not going to understand how objects are represented if you don't understand the role of motion. Because motion is not just this complex confound, it's actually part and parcel of the way the auditory, the way the visual system understands objects. And so I think this is the real problem is if we're using sounds that don't have the properties that we need in order to get to the conclusions that generalize beyond the lab, then we're drawing theories and conclusions from experiments that are then tested with other experiments using stimuli that support them, but we're not really getting at the things we think we're getting at. Which brings me back full circle to the original seemingly ridiculous question that I asked about does sound affect auditory perception? Well, I don't know what any individual person here believes about that because we can't really read one another's minds. So I think it's more useful to look at our actions. And if we think about the actions of what it is we're actually choosing to study and not study, we're acting almost as if, in many ways, uh, the, these kinds of things like sound don't play a role in auditory perception. Now, in some ways, I'm doing the ultimate preaching to the choir by having this talk here for AppCam. And so uh, part of the reason why I was so excited about the opportunity to speak with you is that I know there's many people here that are using more interesting temporally complex sounds, and I've seen them in the posters and the talks previously. But I can't tell you how many times at conferences I've had whispered conversations with colleagues who've said, I empathize with what you're doing, but when I've tried to use more complex sounds, I just get slammed by reviewers. And my favorite was a response of someone who had a four-part experiment they were very excited about and ultimately they were only allowed to publish the first three part with synthesized tones because the reviewers wouldn't sign on to the natural sound that had too many things that could be confounds. Now I certainly understand the the importance of limiting confounds but I think we also lose something when we focus so much on experimental control which is a point that John Newoff has made in, in many talks and papers in the past. And so ultimately, I'm hoping that this can be the kind of thing that we can point to in those situations to show that there's some value in looking at more complex sounds and situations, even if it creates some other problems. So I don't want to keep anyone too long. Just want to acknowledge the funding agencies that helped to support this work, and also the army of students that are in the proverbial lab now helping to do some of this, uh, the extensions to this work. I also wanted to point out that one of these students could be you. We have an opening for fall of 2021. So Assuming we still have things like universities and democracy at that point, uh, we'll have an opportunity for some other students. So thank you very much for your attention and thanks so much to the organizers for setting up this meeting. It's been really delightful to get to have a conference-like experience uh, today. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have now. Yeah, so um, Bill Yost asked, uh, why is speech not included as a sound? Great question. So here we were specifically looking at non-speech tasks just because that was the scope of this. So it'd be interesting to do these kinds of surveys with speech as well. And we've got probably time for this last question. Carolyn Palmer asks, uh, great talk, first of all. Uh, did some of the non-referential studies examine sensitivity by today's listeners to computer-generated sound dimensions, suggesting the auditory system adapts to non-referential sounds? Hmm. 
As far as I know, they weren't specifically looking at this. And I think part of the problem is we're only using non-referential sounds in situations where there's a question specifically focused at that. So I think that's a great thing to look at, uh, but it's not one that I noticed, at least in this sample of auditory stimuli. All right, that's, that's the time. But of course, if there are other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Great talk, thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, uh, we've got Manda Fisher with her talk titled, Directed Attention at Exposure Modulates Implicit Memory for Real World Soundscapes at Retrieval. Uh, Amanda, whenever you're ready, take it away. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Amanda Fisher and I'll be talking to you today broadly about memory and attention and its role in um, real world sounds. So to start off, we might take an everyday uh, situation like listening at the dinner table for granted, but the very act of making sense of what we hear is really quite complicated. So if we take John here in the middle, for example, he might have an easy time hearing what Jim to his left is saying, but when the party really gets started, uh, what seemed easy at first becomes a lot harder. We wish that it were in our power to the introduce of the, the German larynx. taste. Cavity with the Luckily for John, his brain can act as a super decoder and help him organize the auditory scene. So before John knows what he's hearing, the complex jumbled up pressure wave that arrives at his eardrum must first be decomposed into separate mental representations. And it's on the basis of what is grouped together that perceptual attributes like pitch and timbre and loudness are computed and sounding objects in the environment recognized. Um, and memory and attention are two factors that can bias how we organize this incoming information. So in a previous study, we examined memory and attention's effect in auditory scene analysis by uh, first uh, asking whether merely presenting a tone and a sound clip together without deliberately associating one with the other was sufficient to bias attention to a given site. And we also used EEG to examine the neural correlates at retrieval to see their role in guiding attention. So to examine this, we embedded a pure tone in a real world sound clip in either the left or the right ear so that associations between the tone's location and the sound would be made. So for our memory cue condition, uh, for example, participants would hear a clip of babies with a tone on the left and they're wearing um, ear inserts. Or cows on right. And for a control no association condition, uh, we had our neutral cue trials that had the sound played alone without any um, tone embedded inside of it. So in terms of the experimental layout, uh, the experiment started with four exposure blocks where participants performed a distractor task. They were told to classify the sounds as man-made or natural. And then following a short break, there was a surprise test uh, where we included some new sound clips. And now every single sound had a very faint hidden pure tone inside of it. They had to detect it as quickly as possible in either the left or the right ear. And then they had to tell us if it was an old sound or a new one. If they said that they had heard the sound before, then they would indicate if it was specifically recollected to them or if it was merely familiar. And then finally, um, we asked them, can you remember the first time you heard cows, for example? Was there a beep inside of the sound? And if so, was it on the left or the right? And this scared some participants because <laughs> it came as a surprise to them. Uh, so in terms of the results for this first study, uh, firstly, we found that Associations were formed incidentally at the neural level. So there was a difference between memory cue and neutral cue conditions. But this effect did not guide attention at the level that influenced behavior. Uh, 
suggesting that a silent or neural memory trace had been formed. Now, research has shown that silent engrams are memory traces in the brain that, that do not necessarily control behavior. And in other words, the memory of the association can exist orthogonal to the recovering of the memory itself. And so interestingly, a distinction can be made between the neural trace and the implicit memory. So it's possible that the way we manipulate attention at encoding, if we have direct attention now at encoding, this may aid retrieval of the memory trace at test in the form of an implicit memory at the level that would then influence behavior. So the reason being uh, is that conditions during exposure may affect retrieval. Uh, previous research has shown that perceptual segmentation of foreground and background precedes and may even mediate this contextual learning. So the foreground and background relations uh, might matter. And in the case of the current experiment, attention at exposure was guided towards the clip itself when they were asked to judge it as man-made or natural, which would have foregrounded that information and made the tone uh, backgrounded. And then at test, now when they're asked to detect this very faint hidden pure tone, this would have been backgrounded information. So there's an incongruency in the foreground background relations. So in this follow-up, we were interested in manipulating attention at encoding, and now um, had the embedded pure tone vary in terms of frequency and had participants judge whether the tone now was high or low the pitch. So our aim then was to test whether manipulating attention at encoding affects then memory guided attention at retrieval at a level that influences behavior. In terms of the expected results, uh, as I mentioned in the first experiment, we found evidence of a neural trace of the association, but there was no behavioral difference in the speed of target detection when the beep was embedded in memory Q clips compared to neutral Q ones. In this follow-up, uh, when considering attention at encoding, we expect that if attention is now guided towards the tone at exposure and then at retrieval, um, this will be sufficient to guide attention to facilitate target detection such that now um, targets embedded in memory queue conditions would be uh, detected faster than those embedded in neutral queue ones. So for the results, um, I'll first talk about the memory accuracy for correctly remembered clips. So this is an answer to the question, did you hear this sound? Is it old or new? So a, a reminder for experiment one, uh, we saw this is foregrounded information and it's good. Participants are able to explicitly report whether or not they heard cow, babies, and distinguish between the ones that they, uh, the new sounds. In experiment two, uh, when participants we're told to judge whether the tone was high or low, and we made no reference necessarily to the clips. We see now that explicit memory for the clips is at chance level, with a bit of a bias for above chance level for new clips because of a tendency for participants to report that the sound is new to them. In terms of the uh, question four, so can they report explicitly the association between the sound clip and the uh, location of the tone. So uh, babies on left, cows on right. In experiment one, we see that participants are performing at chance level. And in experiment two, we replicate this. So um, they're still performing at chance level. They can't, uh, they seem to just be guessing um, as to whether this clip was paired with a certain tone on a given side. So in summary, memory for the clip, explicit memory that is, and the location of the tone is not so good in this follow-up. So in terms of reaction time for detecting now this very faint hidden pure tone in every single sound clip, um, in experiment one, we saw a processing efficiency effect. So tones that were embedded in old sounds that they had heard before at exposure uh, are detected quicker than new ones. And this effect uh, as expected was replicated in experiment two. And this makes sense. Um, so memory facilitates efficient allocation of auditory resources in the sense that if you're looking for your keys in a familiar context, like your house, you might be faster at finding it um, compared to if you were in an unfamiliar context. 
Now looking when we break up the old condition into memory Q and neutral Q um, for detecting this very faint hidden pure tone. Um, again, in experiment one, we did not see um, any significant difference between memory Q and neutral Q clips. Uh, but in experiment two, the follow-up, when now they're asked to judge the tone is higher or low during exposure, um, we do see a facilitation effect. And this is interesting. Um, it's at the level of behavior and suggests that now maybe this uh, neural trace is accessible uh, to then facilitate um, uh, like target detection in real time. So basically expectation for perception. So when attention is oriented to the target exposure and at test, so a congruency between the foreground background relations, memory guide attention in the context of mere exposure is possible. So to summate, uh, we found a replication of the old new effect, old clips are processed faster than new ones. And in terms of the memory guided attention effect, target detection is faster for memory Q clips than for neutral Q ones. And this uh, suggests that foreground and background relations play an important role in learning and then retrieval. And also the finding supports the attention dependent learning hypothesis, suggesting that only when attention is guided towards the target exposure is implicit knowledge of the clips association sufficient to guide attention at the level that influences behavior. Neurally, um, as I mentioned in experiment one, we indexed the neural trace of the association between the clip and the tone. And we're currently um, collecting an EEG sample and replicating this follow-up to try to index the implicit associative memory between the clip and the tone. We're also looking at theta and alpha oscillations at test to see the role of top-down attention and also memory retrieval. Thank you. Excellent. Um, if there's questions, feel free to type them in. We've got about um, four minutes for questions. So Carolyn Palmer says, thank you. Um, do you have specific uh, theta or alpha hypotheses? Uh, we do. We have some preliminary results as well. Um, so in terms of uh, alpha, we're interested in looking for alpha lateralization um, to index the top-down uh, control of the attention. So um, I didn't go so much into the EEG, but uh, before the beep, we're looking at we're interested in seeing if we can see participants guiding their attention to a given side in expectation of that beep. And for the theta, we're interested um, in seeing um, some theta oscillations uh, in the hippocampal regions, because that is an area that has been uh, implicated in memory guided attention, uh, this effect. I feel like I'm using that new pedagogical tool, wait time, just to elicit some questions here. <laughs> but I know that it takes a long time to type. I've had long questions that I just had to delete because it took me too long with my clumsy fingers. That happens to me as well. Or I delete <laughs> it by accident and then, and then too late, I miss the window. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I guess I'll stop uh, sharing my screen so we can all see each other. Yeah. I'll give it a, a few more seconds, see if any, any of those late questions are coming in. It was a great talk, by the way. Thank you. I'm sure some will pop up in the chat. And of course, by email is fine as well. 
even Absolutely, yeah. weeks or months or years down the line. <laughs> <laughs> As people are falling asleep tonight, they'll probably be like, oh, I have the perfect, now I want to know. I developed the question that I had while I was doing this. Um, all right. Well, while you guys stew on that, we'll uh, move to our last talk, which is uh, another one of my colleagues from ASU, uh, Shin Luo with a talk titled, this is a long title and I didn't put my glasses on. So effects of stimulus modality and cueing on working memory and the relationship with speech recognition in older cochlear implant users. Sheen, when you're ready, uh, take it away. All right, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me well? Okay, good. So um, yeah, again, thank you, the organizer, for this opportunity to uh, present our research. So I also want to uh, acknowledge the collaboration of my students and the colleague in this project. Um, here we are interested in cochlear implant, an electronic device that restores hearing sensation to profoundly deaf people. Um, but the thing is, different CI users have very different outcomes in speech recognition. And the underlying factors for such intersubject variability have not been well studied in uh, specifically in older CI users uh, aged 60 and above. So for that population, um, the, the variability I think comes from two aspects. One is the age-related declines in auditory sensitivity related, uh, that's related to the uh, bottom-up processing. But the other aspect um, is the age-related declines in uh, cognitive functions, such as working memory. Now, based on the ease of language understanding model, uh, we know that when we uh, listen to speech in noise, we may use uh, working memory, uh, language knowledge, context cues to, uh, you know, fill up missing information and resolve ambiguity. Now for that reason, uh, correlation between working memory and speech recognition has been consistently found um, in normal hearing and hearing impaired listeners. But this has not been consistently found in a small number of studies with older CI users. Uh, I think this may be because um, studies with normal hearing or hearing impaired listeners tended to use uh, reading span, a complex measure of working memory that involves uh, information storage and processing. But studies with CI users tended to use simple um, letter or digit span. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, working memory specific to the degraded auditory input may be more relevant to speech recognition of CI users as compared to working memory in um, the visual modality. Uh, also, the correlation may be stronger for sentence recognition that involves semantic and syntactic, uh, syntactic processing as compared to isolated word recognition. So uh, the goal of this study uh, was to kind of clarify the relationship between uh, speech recognition and uh, uh, working memory in older cognitive implant OCI users um, so that we can optimize the evidence-based oral rehabilitation for this growing population. So our design is relatively simple as compared to the previous uh, talks you have heard. So we, we, we just administered a series of speech recognition and working memory measures in three groups of participants. So we had um, older cochlear implant OCI users, age-matched older acoustic hearing OAH listeners, and younger normal hearing YNH listeners. The three groups uh, would allow us to separate the effects of CI and aging on uh, working memory and speech recognition. I also wanna mention the OAH listeners, some of them had um, mild to moderate hearing loss at high frequencies, which is uh, pretty typical for their ages. So we measured the speech reception threshold, which was the signal to noise ratio for 50% correct sentence, AZ bio sentence recognition or CNC word recognition in 
um, multi talker speech level noise. So that's our sp speech recognition measure. And then we included two simple audit, uh, working memory measures. The first one was everyone familiar with the auditory digit span. Um, so after the fixation cross, the participant listened to a series of auditory digits. Seven, nine, one, six, three, eight. And then recall those digits in the presented order. Another simple working memory measure, the visual letter span, which is in the visual modality and of a general modality measure. Um, we, uh, very similar design, after the cross uh, fixation cross, the participant saw a series of visual letters. And recall them in the presented order and the uh, digit and letter span was just the length of the longest list that were correctly recorded two out of three times. So then we'll talk about the complex working memory measures. Um, in this dual modality working memory measure, we um, presented auditory digits and the visual letters at the same time to the participant. And there were four conditions. Uh, in this auditory queued condition, the participant saw a ear icon and then the participant know that they would recall the auditory digits later, okay? So during the presentation, most likely they would focus their attention to the audio digits while ignoring the visual letters. So here's an example. Three, six, seven, one, eight. And then recall the auditory digits. The second condition, auditory uncued condition, uh, they saw a question mark before stimulus presentation. So they didn't know which modality they would recall later after the presentation. Uh, as such, during the presentation, they would likely to uh, divide their attention between the two modalities and keep both information in the working memory. Uh, but eventually they were asked to recall the auditory digits. So we have two other conditions, individual modality. Um, so the visual cue condition, they saw uh, eye icon uh, before the stimulus presentation and were asked to recall the visual letters uh, later on. In this visual uncued condition, they saw a question mark and uh, were asked to recall the visual letters later on. Okay, so uh, for these conditions, we calculated the percentage of uh, auditory or visual recall across uh, a range of list length uh, as a measure of complex working memory. Uh, we also included a reading span because like I said, this was very often used in studies with normal hearing or hearing impaired listeners. And the task is like this, the participant saw a sentence and judge whether this made sense or not, and then saw a video letter, and this was just continued for several trials, and then they record the video letters, um, and we calculated the percent correct. So these are the measures. Now let's take a look at the results. Now this table shows you the uh, speech reception threshold for sentence and word recognition in the three groups of participants. You can see the mean performance and the standard error. Um, and I also want to mention the higher the threshold, the worse the performance. So what you can see is that OAH listeners performed significantly worse than YNH listeners. Um, from previous studies, we know that this was largely driven by the degraded temporal resolution with aging. Um, and then you can also see that OCI users performed significantly worse than the other two groups. And our studies have shown that this was largely driven by the degraded spectral and temporal resolution with cochlear implants. Uh, one thing I wanna mention is that you notice that for each group, the SRT, the threshold was much higher for the word recognition than for the sentence recognition. It seems like each group uh, benefited similarly from the contextual cues available in the sentence recognition, but not available in 
water recognition. Now, for the simple auditory digit and visual letter span, um, the three groups generally had similar performance. The only exception was that OCI users had lower auditory digit span than the YNH listener. Um, studies have shown that OCI users had no trouble recognizing the auditory digits, but their identification speed or time was significantly slower than YNH listeners. And that's probably why they had lower auditory span, a uh, digit span. Now, for the complex reading span, both the OAH and OCI users, uh, listeners had significantly lower performance than the YNH group, uh, reflecting the age-related declines in attention control and uh, chronological processing. Now, this figure shows you the performance for auditory digital recall and visual letter recall um, for the three groups in the cute and uncute condition. In the um, auditory uncute condition, all groups perform similarly, but in the visual uncute condition, the two older groups perform much worse. And this suggests that they may have put more attention and working memory towards the degraded auditory input than to the normal um, or uh, visual input in the uncued condition. And then three groups had significant cueing effects for visual recall and of similar magnitude, as you can see, but the YNH group had much greater cueing effects for auditory recall than the two group uh, at older age. Again, this could be because um, the older groups may have put a lot of cognitive resources to the degraded auditory input even without cueing, okay? So correlation analysis showed that auditory cued and auditory uncued working memory scores uh, were the only working memory measures that were significantly correlated with speech recognition uh, for older copy implant users, users and acoustic hearing listeners. There was no evidence uh, for stronger correlation with um, sentence recognition versus uh, word recognition. So uh, in summary, um, the two older groups had similar working memory scores, either for simple or complex measures, even with a degraded auditory input for CI users. The um, age-related declines in working memory were mainly observed in complex tasks with um, a competing task or competing stimuli. And I think the most interesting finding uh, is in the dual modality working memory, in which we found that cueing effect on visual recall was similar for the groups, but cueing effect on auditory recall reduced greatly for older group. Now, finally, um, consistent with our hypothesis, the complex working memory specific to the degraded auditory input seems better reflect the uh, cognitive load of speech recognition in noise for uh, CI users as compared to simple working memory or visual working memory. So this may have some indications for oral rehabilitation. For example, you can have a training protocol including uh, auditory working memory task with some attentional components that may better uh, improve speech recognition in noise for CI users as compared to the simple digit span chaining uh, that have been used before in previous studies. So um, I'll stop here and see if uh, anyone has any questions. Okay. Well, Sheen, while um, other people type their questions and I've got a quick little in the weeds working memory question for you, but um, what scoring method did you use for the working memory measures? Sorry, what's the question? It's uh, what scoring method did you use for the working memory measures? Oh yeah, we used the slightly different um, uh, measures for different uh, 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 scores for different measures. Like I said, simple uh, digit span or letter span, we just look at the longest length that can be correctly recorded two out of three times. And then for the complex working memory measures, we uh, calculated the um, the percent correct of uh, either visual or auditory recall across uh, this lens, say from lens three all the way to lens of seven. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Laura asks, speaking of cognitive load at the end of a conference day, how stable are digit span scores over time for the same participants? Now, unfortunately, we didn't um, test them multiple times because uh, we, we usually have all the participants in the lab just once and do, uh, like, let's say, one or two hours of testing. So I couldn't say too much about the test retest, but I, I'm, I'm guessing um, probably for older people, there will be greater variability as compared to younger people. Um, again, um, I don't have the data to back up that. We've got uh, time for probably one more question, if there is one. All right, I know I'm the last speaker of the conference. And uh, again, I wanna appreciate all the effort the organizing committee has put out to make this possible. I think this is a great uh, conference. I, I was only able to jump on some of the talks, uh, but I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, thank you so much. Um, it was a great series of talks. Just yeah. to echo that, I, I mean, all the speakers were, were great, I thought. Um, all right, it looks like maybe that's it for questions. Everybody's got the Zoom fatigue. All right, thank you so much, guys. That yeah, thank awesome. you very much. That was a great talk. All right, hey, you did it. That's the end of the conference, but it's not the end of your day. If you want to stick around for the business meeting, I'm going to hand things over to, well, I'm going to hand things over first to Tim uh, if you want to conclude the conference and then uh, take it to business meeting. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. On behalf of the rest of the organizing committee and the other stakeholders that have helped us organize and implement this, uh, I wanted to acknowledge and thank everyone's appreciation. Uh, that, that means a lot to us, so thank you. <laughs>